one of my employees uh, has not shown up to work for three days. So I came out to his house. His car's here. Uh, doors are all locked. The windows, shades are all drawn. This murder was front page news. I suffered. I suffered big time. The way in which each of the victims were killed was, um, was very brutal. Richard was shot, had a wound to his head. John, whoever did it, and was able to cut his throat. The mom was killed in the same manner. She was hit in the head as well with a hammer, and her throat was also cut. Richard worked uh, in the crypto department, and of course when uh, you have those high clearances and you don't show up for work, a lot of people get very concerned. Whoever did this came over there for a specific reason. Why so much focus on the cigarette butt in the trash? Because it's bad for them. It is beyond a reasonable doubt bad for them. I'm going to find out and I'm going to put your ass in jail. In the city of Pensacola, there is a family called the Smiths. They lived together in a house at 4605 Deerfield Drive and were known to be very close to each other, keeping mostly to themselves. The family consisted of a 77-year-old mother named Von Seal Bonnie Smith and her two sons. Richard Smith, also known as RT, was 47 years old and worked as an IT specialist for Homeland Security, while John Smith was 49 years old and was a Walmart employee. On Friday, July 31, 2015, RT's supervisor, Hal McCord, tried to call him, but RT didn't answer the phone or return the call. This worried Hal because RT had not shown up for work for three days in a row. RT was known to be a dedicated and reliable employee who never missed work without letting anyone know. It's also important to mention that RT's job required him to be available by phone all the time, especially when he was on a regular schedule. Since Hal couldn't get a hold of RT, he decided to drive to the Smith house to check on him and make sure everything was okay. When Hal reached the house, he saw two cars parked in the driveway, and one of them was RT's white Toyota Highlander. He tried knocking on the door several times, but no one answered. This made Hal concerned that something might be wrong, because with the cars parked outside, it meant that the family should be inside the residence. He then called 911 and asked the authorities to conduct a welfare check on RT and the Smith family. Once the call came in, Deputy Andrew Smith hurried to the Smith residence at 4605 Deerfield Drive, Pensacola. There, he met Hal, RT's boss, who shared his concerns about RT's mysterious disappearance. Hal described the whole situation, and he also mentioned Donald Wayne Harding, who was also a part of the Smith family and was RT's half-brother. Donald was Bonnie's son from a previous marriage, but he didn't live with the family. Despite that, they seemed to have a close bond. Donald worked as a security officer at a hospital in Pensacola. Once the deputy learned that Donald lived just a few miles away, he quickly drove to Donald's house to question him about the Smith family's whereabouts. Donald informed the deputy that he hadn't seen them in the past three days. When they returned to the Smith house, Donald assured them that all three family members should be inside the residence. With his permission, they entered the house to investigate. They noticed that only the back door was open and all the other doors and windows were locked from the inside. As they stepped inside, they were met with a disturbing and unsettling scene. Um, so as we walk in the back door, I immediately smelled a very foul odor, uh, similar to a dead body. Walked in, I had that smell, and so I was kind of assuming basically that there was going to be someone probably dead inside. As I opened the door, I immediately saw blood spatter on some cardboard boxes that were sitting up on a bed. Um, and then on the floor directly in front of me, there was like a large mass of like clothing and blanket. As they entered the Smith house, they saw that the rooms were filled with boxes and heaps of blankets and clothes making it hard to navigate through. With determination, they began to peel back the layers, uncovering surprises along the way. First, they found a large shoe hidden under the blankets, but to their shock, it was not alone. After removing all the blankets, they discovered the lifeless bodies of John and Richard covered under piles of clothes in the den. Determined to investigate further, they continued down the hallway. Behind a closed bedroom door, they encountered another mysterious mound of clothing and blankets scattered on the floor. As they slowly pulled away the layers, they revealed the lifeless body of Bonnie sitting motionless on a chair. The unsettling truth hit them hard as all three family members were found dead. Later, more detectives and a forensic team from the Pensacola Police Department arrived at the house. As investigators combed through the house, they stumbled upon chilling evidence. In the kitchen, they found a blood-covered hammer, and in the living room, a copper jacket and a projectile from a 9mm bullet lay separated on the floor. At first, they thought the killer had shot the victims and then used the hammer to ensure they were dead. However, the shocking truth emerged when the medical examiner arrived. 
Bonnie and John had suffered blows to their heads and their throats had been cut. It seemed that the killer first attacked John while he was watching TV and then he snuck up on Bonnie from behind, attacking her with the hammer and cutting her throat. RT, on the other hand, had been shot in the head from behind. But what was even more puzzling was that none of the victims had any defensive wounds, as if they hadn't put up a fight against their attacker. This led the investigators with two intriguing theories. One possibility was that the killer was someone who was close to the family, someone they knew and trusted, and that's why they didn't resist. The other theory was that the killer was incredibly cunning and stealthy, catching the family off guard, leaving them no chance to defend themselves. But there was something odd about the Smith family that the investigators learned. They were known for being very private and didn't interact much with their neighbors. Bonnie, the mother, rarely left the house and spent her days watching the QVC shopping channel on TV. She had a habit of ordering items from QVC every day. Even when Hal arrived at the house, he noticed multiple packages on the front porch. Inside, the house was filled with huge boxes and piles of clothes, all from Bonnie's QVC shopping spree. It was as if the family lived in their own little world, disconnected from the outside. As the investigators delved deeper into the case, they initially believed that the motive behind the crime might have been robbery. However, when they searched RT's room, they found an unlocked closet containing a safe. Inside the safe, there was a red envelope filled with $1,809 in cash and various white envelopes containing a total of $11,842 in cash. They also discovered a box with a necklace inside. In John's room, they came across multiple cell phones, a laptop, two Kindles, and two iPads. These findings made the investigators reconsider the robbery theory and eventually ruled it out as a motive for the crime. After thoroughly investigating the crime scene, the investigators returned to Donald Harding, who was waiting outside in the driveway. They broke the devastating news to him that his family members were all found dead. As the only family member left, they asked Donald to come to the sheriff's office for questioning. A deputy escorted him to the office where the mystery behind the tragic incident began to unfold and Donald's involvement became a crucial part of the investigation. During the interview, the investigator Matt Infinger began by asking Donald about his family, their backgrounds, and their daily routines. I guess you know why you're down here to talk about your mom and your brothers, okay? Um, as I told you out there on the scene, they are deceased, okay? When was the last time you saw your family? Tuesday. I went over. I always go over on Tuesday to take my dog and let her run. I went over there about... I went a little earlier than usual. Sometimes I don't go over to about 3. But I went over a little bit earlier. And I got there probably about 1 or one thirty, And uh, I stayed pretty much out in the yard playing with the dogs. Go in, talk to Mama, watch television together. She loves QVC. She watches it all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, she puts it on the news. You know, and, and I fix dinner for them every Tuesday. And uh, I made dinner. And what did you make? Uh, fried, fried chicken. Uh, let's see. Oh, oh, oh. John always picks out what we eat, and I cook it when I get there. So we had fried chicken, green beans, corn, and biscuits, and french fries. Okay. Is there any leftovers or anything? Well, yeah, I always put our teas in the stove. I always put his in the stove. His is always in the stove when he gets home from work because he don't. Sometimes he don't get in until eight nine o'clock. Oh, okay. Um, and RT is Richard. That's Richard Thomas. Okay. Yeah, he's the one that works out at the base. He works long hours out there. Gotcha. Now, was he there when you were there Tuesday? No, I never saw RT. I always leave before he. Well, not always, but most of the time I leave before he gets home. Okay. Well, I usually stay and watch the news with Mama and leave after that. Well, you watch the 5 o'clock news? Yeah. 5.30 news? 6 right. o'clock? Which one? The, the, well, normally we watch the national news. At 5.30? At 5.30, and then I leave right after that. And that's about what time I left. was between I'd say between 5.30 and 6, right in there. Okay. According to the medical examiner, the Smith family had been killed on Tuesday, July 28, 2015, three days before their bodies were found. Donald said during the interrogation that on that day, he'd been with the family and even cooked food for them. Since no one in the neighborhood saw anyone coming to the house or the family leaving since Tuesday, it became clear that Donald was the last person to see them alive. Detective Infinger had serious suspicions about Donald's involvement in the murder, 
so he decided to tell him about how the family was killed to observe his reaction and gather more information. He was telling me how they were killed and uh, they were shot, shot to death. All shot to death? Yeah. Oh my God. Looks like your brother John was just sitting there watching TV and somebody just shot him while he was sitting in his chair. And then your mother was sitting in her chair. Somebody shot her while she was watching TV. You were probably still there. And then RT comes home. If someone is innocent and hears the shocking news of their family's death, they would typically be extremely upset and find it hard to believe. However, when Donald was informed about his family's demise, he appeared surprisingly calm and accepted the situation. He didn't show the expected emotions of shock or sadness. This behavior raised suspicions among the investigators because his lack of emotions seemed unusual for someone who just lost their loved ones. It made them consider that perhaps Donald had killed his family. Your mother's pretty much the only family you got. Yes. And you've shown no emotion the whole time you've been in here. And you've known that they've been dead. Oh, no. I mean, it's like you almost prepared yourself for this. You've had days to prepare yourself for this. That's yes, right. I'll, 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 I'll show plenty of emotion when the time's right. Let me ask you this. Did your brother kill your mother and you kill him? No. I, I don't know nothing about this. This is the first time I've ever heard any of this stuff. You're talking about they was dead? Shot? Yeah. I don't know nothing about it. You mean you're going to come in here and tell me you got three people dead in a house? Yes. You're going to come in here. You were the last one to see them. You're going to come in here and tell the me last one to see that you didn't kill them and you're sitting there and I've told you that your mom was shot and drugged to her bedroom and you're going to sit here and not show any emotion whatsoever? I've got emotion, sir. No, you don't. Yes, I do. When investigators questioned Donald, he appeared surprisingly composed and ready for the questioning. Finally, to get his confession, the investigator directly asked him the crucial question, why did you kill your family? Um, you killed these people. You killed your family. No, I didn't. Why? I did not kill my family. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. How can you sit there and have no remorse about what's happened Show I no emotion. But right now, I'm, I'm kind of feeling like I'm being accused of something here that I didn't I am do. accusing you of doing it. I think you did it. I did not do it. Why would I do it? Why would I kill my own family? Why would I do it? Why would I kill my mother and my brothers when I've been living down here for 15 years? Because they're not your real brothers, and they're over there living with they your They were mom, just like my real brothers. Probably getting whatever they wanted. Maybe you did get money from your mom before. Maybe they talked her into cutting you off. You got pissed off and went over there and killed them. Well, now that makes good sense, but it ain't true. That makes real good sense, but it ain't true. I would never hurt my brothers. Let me tell you something. Or my mother. If somebody, if somebody, if I was sitting where you are, and somebody was talking to me and saying you killed your your mom and your brothers, I'd tell them to go fuck off. I'd be mad as fuck. Well, I know better. And you're sitting over there, than you and you that. haven't shed one tear, hadn't said nothing, hadn't gotten mad, shown no emotion about none of this. And oh. you expect me to sit here and believe you didn't kill those people? I sure do, because I didn't. Well, I don't. And I'm not going to attack some sheriff's deputy because my mother has been killed. So I know you didn't do it. No. I didn't know you or your family till today. That's right. And now I have to sit here and try and figure out who killed your mother and your two brothers. Yes, you do, and I hope you do it soon. Well, I promise you this, I'm gonna find out. I know and you if will, you sir. did it, I'm gonna find out and I'm gonna put your ass in jail. I would not harm my family, sir, for nothing in this world. The detectives tried really hard to make Donald admit to the crime, but he kept saying he didn't do it. They asked him the same questions many times, but he stuck to his story of innocence. 
Unfortunately, they couldn't keep questioning him because they didn't have enough evidence to use against him, so they had to let him go. But this interrogation made them start looking more closely at Donald as the main suspect. To gather more evidence, their first step was to search Donald's house, for which they obtained a search warrant. They carefully examined every part of the house, and what they discovered was incredibly unexpected. This new evidence completely changed the direction of the investigation, adding a surprising twist to the story. During their search, they came across some unusual and unsettling items. They found a Ouija board along with some wicked books and strange artifacts. I guess you have a Ouija board and some stuff in your house? Yeah, I do have a Ouija board. Are you a Wiccan or...? Yeah, I'm a Wiccan. Additionally, they discovered a room set up for some kind of ritual, which was quite odd and mysterious. This discovery led to the case being dubbed the Blue Moon Murders, as it became misunderstood and surrounded by strange and occult associations. In the past, people used to call it a blue moon when there was more than one full moon in a season. But nowadays, we say it's a blue moon even if there are two full moons in one month. This kind of event doesn't occur very often, only taking place every few years. Surprisingly, on July 28, 2015, there was a full moon, and that was actually a blue moon because it was the second full moon in that month. After discovering the strange items in Donald's house, the investigators suspected that he might have killed his family in a bizarre ritual as practiced by some Wiccans during a blue moon. This ritual involves hitting the sacrifice on the head to spill their blood and then covering their body to keep them warm. The evidence found at the crime scene strongly suggested that Donald had performed such a ritual to kill his family. The investigators wanted to be sure about the kind of rituals Donald performed at his home and whether they were connected to the blue moon theory and the murder of the Smith family. So they called Donald to the station for another interview to gather more information and confirm their suspicions. At your house, another investigator was telling me about it and I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, I guess you have a Ouija board and some stuff in your house? Yeah, I do have a Ouija board. I have a prayer room. Are you, do you, are you a Wiccan or? Yeah, I'm a Wiccan. You are? I've been a Wiccan for about three years. Have you? Yeah. What is that? It's a pagan religion. It's based on uh, nature. What? I'm not familiar with it. Can you explain it a little bit more for me? Well, you celebrate different seasonal times, like seasonal changes. Yeah, like 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 different holidays. You know, like when it's autumn equinox and spring equinox and stuff like that. Does it's a very old religion. Yeah. Does it have to do with, like, uh, moon phases and stuff like that? Yes, it does. Okay. There's a lot to do with moon phases. Like what? Well, it's just certain times when you have Sabbaths and stuff like that. What is a Sabbath? Sabbath is, is a, a worship ceremony uh -huh. that you hold. And what does that consist of? Oh, uh, prayers. Mostly prayers. It's usually done in a circle. That that Wiccan stuff, um, in these ceremonies or whatever you do, do you have anything like sacrifices or anything? No, no there's no sacrifices in Wiccan. I did some reading on it before I talked to you about it. And in some of these Wiccan things, uh, like especially this time of the year, in June, July, and August, or July and August, when there's two, mo two, two full moons, sometimes they'll uh, offer a sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't offer sacrifices ever. <laughs> well, it described it the way that... It's a blue moon. It's mm -hmm. a blue moon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's very, very rare. Yeah. Very rare time of the year. Last time it happened was how long ago? Oh, I don't know. Three years ago? Well, it wasn't too long ago. I don't remember hearing about it on the radio, but I couldn't tell you exactly when it was. Well, it's kind of interesting what they do. They drain the blood out of their sacrifice and hit them in the head. I don't know and anything then they about cover that. Them. Then they cover them to keep them warm. I don't know anything about that. I mean, I, I've never sacrificed. Well, I, I wouldn't hurt a chicken. I wouldn't. I wouldn't hurt nothing. I would never hurt an animal. Well, what's ironic about all this 
is that's the same way your family was killed. That's the same way my family was killed. After confirming that Donald was aware of the blue moon that occurred on July 28, 2015, when the family was killed, the investigators tried to get him to confess that he killed his family as part of a sacrifice. However, Donald repeatedly denied any knowledge or involvement in such a ritual. The investigators made one last attempt to get a confession from Donald, asking him directly why he killed the Smith family. As the interrogation intensified, tensions rose in the room. Why don't you tell me what you did to him? I didn't do anything to my family, Yeah, sir. you did. We're not going to go through that again. You did, okay? No, sir. I've been over to the house. I've looked at everything. You went over there, and you killed your mother, and you killed your brother, and then you waited, and RT got home, and you killed him. Okay? No, sir. And you killed them all the same way. Stab them. Stabbing them? They were stabbed? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. I thought you said they were shot in the head. I did tell you that last time. Let me ask you this. Why was your... Why... If somebody did... If somebody did this that didn't know your family, why would they... Just sit there, your mother and your brother John, and just let somebody kill him. Why would they do that? It makes no sense. It does makes it? no sense. I agree. Okay. They had to be totally comfortable with whoever was in that house. I, I, I guess they did. No, they had to have been. Well, I mean, I otherwise know, I'm they sure wouldn't they be were. sitting there and let somebody bash them in the fucking head. Okay. They had to be totally comfortable with whoever was in the house. Neighbors say nobody comes and goes over there. The only person they ever see come and go over there is you. I go over there about You were over there Tuesday. Yes. Like he told you earlier, your brother was killed in the clothes that he wore at work Tuesday. Okay. Nobody has seen these people since Tuesday, since you saw them. I was the last one to see them alive. Yeah. So how are you going to sit there and tell us that you didn't kill them when you were the last one to see them? They trusted you, and you killed them. They didn't think anything of it. They didn't know it was coming. With no confession and a lack of physical evidence, Donald was released and allowed to go free. However, the news of witchcraft being involved in a criminal case where a family was killed quickly spread throughout the community. People became fascinated by the unusual and mysterious nature of the case, and it became a topic of discussion everywhere. The story gained so much attention that it became the main headline on various news channels when Sheriff David Morgan publicly announced it. Initial research has led us to believe that there's a potential that it was a ritualistic killing. The method uh, of the murder, uh, blunt force trauma, slit throats, positions of bodies, uh, and then our personal interest uh, has some ties to a, a faith and or religion that is indicative of that. Those of you that follow any of that will also note that uh, you know, the time of death we believe on Tuesday also coincides uh, with what's referred to as a blue moon, which occurs every three years. It's uh, witchcraft, I'll, I'll say that right now. However, in this murder case, the blue moon theory didn't provide any helpful clues for the investigators and their further investigation. The investigation continued for the next three months, focusing on forensics, fingerprints, and DNA evidence collected from the crime scene. It's difficult to make a case when there is a family member involved simply because we knew that Donald Hartung went to the family home on every Tuesday to cook dinner. So the fact that his DNA is going to be there is, you know, a given. But what happened in this case is that his DNA turned up on places where it absolutely should not have been. During the investigation, the detectives discovered DNA belonging to Donald on the inside of RT's belt, which he was wearing at the time of the incident. The blood found at the scene suggested that RT had been moved so that his back pockets were accessible. However, RT's wallet and keys were missing from the scene and were never found. 
The DNA found on the belt belonged to both Donald and R.T. This raised a puzzling question. If Donald had already left the house before R.T. came back home, how did Donald's DNA end up on R.T.'s belt? In the further investigation, the detectives found Donald's DNA on various items at the crime scene. It was discovered on the zipper handle of R.T.'s case where he kept his checkbook and paperwork, and also on the checkbook itself. A black purse was found in the garbage, and it was identified as Bonnie's purse. Surprisingly, Donald's DNA was discovered on the catch, which is the part that closes the purse at the top. Additionally, his DNA was found on the hammer that was found in the kitchen, the very weapon used by the killer to attack and kill John and Bonnie. This raised suspicions because if Donald wasn't present at the house during the attack, his DNA shouldn't have been on these items. The presence of his DNA on crucial pieces of evidence pointed towards his potential involvement in the crime. Among the items investigators discovered was an essential piece of evidence in the garbage can. They carefully brought the entire garbage can back to the lab without disturbing its contents. Layer by layer, they examined the contents and found a cigarette butt with Donald's DNA on it. This was significant because none of the Smith family members smoked except for Donald. What made it even more crucial was its placement on top of bloody paper towels that were used to clean up the crime scene. This suggested that Donald was present during the crime and after committing the act, he'd used the paper towels to clean up. Later, he took a cigarette break and discarded the cigarette butt into the garbage. This evidence played a crucial role in the investigation and ultimately led to Donald's arrest. Donald was officially arrested on October 27, 2015. But this was not the end. The mystery behind why Donald killed his own family remained unclear until the trial began. Donald Harding, who was 63 years old at the time, faced charges of a triple murder case that involved elements of witchcraft. The trial began after five long years on January 17, 2020, in the Escambia County, Florida court. During the trial, the reasons and motives behind the horrific crime were finally revealed and brought to light. During the trial's opening statement, a motive for the case was presented and the theories of witchcraft in the blue moon were ruled out. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Von Seal Smith, Richard Smith, and John Smith. Those are the three people that were killed in this case. And they are the mother and the two half-brothers of this defendant, Donald Hartung. The three of them, Von Seal, Richard, and John, all lived together in their home on Deerfield Drive. And on Tuesday, July 28th of 2015, you will see that this family was brutally and violently murdered by this defendant. And the evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that he did it all for their money. You will see the last will and testament of Von Seal Smith his mother left everything to his two brothers, John and Richard. She specifically excluded him from her will. And what you will see during the course of this trial through evidence is that for him to get anything, they all three had to die. On Tuesday, July 28th of 2015, this defendant had the motive and this defendant had the opportunity. The defense lawyer, Michael Griffin, was prepared to question the inconsistencies in the will and all the evidence discovered at the crime scene. There is no indication of any physical evidence that he committed any of the murders. There was no gun found. There was no gunshot residue found on any of his clothing. There was no blood found at his house. There was no blood found in his car. There was nothing to link him in any way to these murders besides his DNA at his mom's house where he went at least every Tuesday to cook dinner for them, for her and his two half-brothers. Now, as far as the will is concerned, what the will says that Donald Hartung Jr. is excluded. My client is Donald Hartung Sr. Is that an error in drafting the will, or was it meant to exclude Mr. Hartung's son, Donald Hartung Jr.? We don't know, but there's one thing that the state cannot tell you or prove to you is that my client ever saw that will. There is no evidence that my client ever read that will, saw that will, 
or in any way had knowledge of the contents of the will. During the trial, the prosecutors had a witness who was Donald's cellmate. This witness shared crucial information that played a significant role in the trial as it provided valuable evidence against Donald. It's important to note that the cellmate knew intricate details of the case that he couldn't have known unless Donald had shared them with him personally. Did he tell you um, anything about what his relationship was like with his mother? He said he hated his mother because of the way she treated him. She treated him different from the other boys. Did he say why? They had different daddies. Any other reasons he was upset with his mom? Yeah, and she, uh, he, she left him out the wheel. That really made him mad, he said. And what about um, Mr. Hartung's son, ab about the will? Oh, she left him out too. That made him mad. And did he tell you who killed his mother and two brothers? He said he killed them. Did he tell you why? He said he, want, he, he wanted the money because she left him out the will. Okay, so, so if he was mad at his mom, why not just kill his mom? Why the two brothers? Because the money would go to, uh, to, the, to the brothers because he was never in the will. Okay. Then the cellmate revealed what Donald did to his mother before killing her. Um, did he tell you what he did after he um, did that to John? He went to his mother, and then he, he tortured her so she can tell the uh, accommodation for the safes and stuff. He said he tortured her, I'm sorry? He tortured her. How? He cut a, a left pinky finger so he can tell the combination for the safes and stuff. According to the prosecution, when the bodies were found on July 31st, 2015, the family had actually been dead for three days already, since July 28th, 2015. On that day, a neighbor named George Chittenden saw Donald entering the house and leaving later than usual. Did you see Mr. Hartung leave the Smith family, family home on July 28th? Yes, I did. At any point that same day, July 28th, did you see Richard um, come into the neighborhood? Yes. And what was he driving? He was driving the white Toyota. Did you see RT that day on the 28th before or after you saw Donald Hartung leave the residence? It was before Mr. Hartung left the residence. According to the neighbor's testimony, if Donald left the house after RT came back home, that meant his claim that he left the house before RT was back was a lie. In reality, after killing both John and Bonnie, he waited for RT to return. Once RT was back home, Donald killed him too, and according to the neighbor, he left the house around 7.30 p.m. To challenge the timeline of the murder, the defense attorney brought in their own forensic expert, Dr. Jonathan Arden. He argued that the Smith family was killed on July 29, 2015, based on the rate of body decomposition and the ambient heat when the bodies were discovered. Can you say within a reasonable degree of scientific certainty these bodies were not killed on Tuesday? I cannot tell you it's impossible. I can tell you that Tuesday is inconsistent with the scientific and medical evidence. If the jury agreed that the murders took place on July 29, 2015, the day after Donald Hartung had left the house, it would strongly support the argument that Donald did not kill the Smith family. To determine the timeline of the murders, the prosecutor presented a surveillance video of RT. You have the video surveillance of Richard leaving work on July 28th, 2015, at 6.36 p.m. And look at what he's wearing. He is wearing the exact same thing when his body is found on Friday the 31st. And not only that, he's wearing his credentials. What does that tell you? He was murdered right when he got home from work. You heard the other employees. There is no reason to wear those credentials if you are not at work. Additionally, the next day, on July 29th, 2015, John had a doctor's appointment at 10 o'clock a.m., but he didn't show up. The neighbors also didn't see the Smith family after July 28th, 2015, the day when Donald killed them. After four hours of discussing and considering the evidence, the 12-person jury reached their final decision in February 2020. As to the charge in count one, Fonsil Smith, we the jury find the defendant, daughter Hanta, Hartong, guilty of first-degree murder as charged in the indictment. Donald was sentenced to three life sentences in a row, 
which means he'll spend the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of parole. In this case, it acted as the equivalent of a death penalty, as he'll never be released from prison. He's currently serving a sentence of life imprisonment at the Graceville Correctional Facility in Jackson County, Florida. Fay Haas, Donald Harding's cousin, was deeply upset by the verdict. She couldn't believe that her own cousin could commit such a terrible crime and expressed her desire for the death penalty for Donald. I am a Christian, first of all. But I do believe in the death penalty in certain cases when it's a heinous crime. And I think what he did to them was heinous. If it would have just been an argument and he shot them or I shot each other, but the way he did it. So, I'm hoping for the death penalty. But if he gets life, I'll be fine with it, you know? Because I've already asked God, God, have your will, you know? Your will be done, not mine. And it hurts to say that I want the death penalty because he's my cousin too. And that's what's hard about it. I can't believe he did this to his own mother and his brothers. What are your thoughts on this case? Do you believe witchcraft played a role in Donald killing his family? We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comment section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.